consider this. There's another uh, note I recently posted on Facebook called um, Falling Stars. Okay, I'm going I'm to read this here. The following was recently added to uh, the blog that I wrote, the Bible and the Still Flat Earth page on my website, testingtheglobe.com. So if you go there and if you're you're new to all this, it, it's now incorporated. When I first did a show on this, it wasn't. Uh, I hadn't written this part yet. I, I added it to it. Um, it is also just a snapshot of what I'll be covering in my Angels as Stars blog, which I'm still working on. Okay, I wrote, in my previous videos and blogs concerning the Flat Earth controversy, I've been showing what the scriptures have to say and the reality we are presented with when we just let them speak to us, literally. Now we also have to deal with scriptures that describe the stars falling from heaven and or ceasing to give their light, such as these scriptures. I mean, when part of the Coriolis deal is not just, you know, um, dealing with long-range shooters or, you know, the spiral of the drain, you know, which way it drains or the spiral of, um, you know, um, hurricanes and stuff like that, you know, spinning in different directions depending on, you know, on a globe on the northern or southern hemisphere. But we, part of that is also dealing with the um, motion of the stars. People will, will comment and say, well, the stars are spinning one way as viewed from the north, or northern hemisphere, and yet the stars appear to be rotating in the opposite direction uh, from the southern hemisphere. And for the longest time, that one really gave me, and still, it should be to be honest, still gives me trouble. Um, I've read some of the various flat earther arguments and, and seen some of the videos that are out there on it. And, you know, some of it's convincing. Some of it, I'm, I still have the, well, yeah, but what about this? What about that? Uh, and it was when I began to contemplate all that, that, that I was led to do this whole angels of stars things and, and write what I'm about to read right here. Okay. Cause we have these descriptions of stars falling from heaven and also ceasing to give their light, like right here in Isaiah 13. Uh, verses 9 and 10. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. What? The stars and constellations are going to wink out and no longer give their light? But what about the alleged planets going around those stars, right? I mean, we're told that, you know, all the stars are out there just like our solar system. You know, our, our sun is a star, you know, just like, and it has planets going around it. And the stars out there, you know, are just like our sun. They got planets going around them. Of course, we can try and rationalize this away and say that, well, we just won't be able to see the stars because the sky on the Earth is going to be cloudy or, you know, offer up some other lame, eisegetical explanation. But that's not what the text says. We must also consider the fact that Genesis, as well as the book of Enoch, both tell us that the moon is a female, lesser light that is self-illuminating. Nothing in the ancient text even hint at her as being a reflector of the sun. Even science confirms the fact that her light is quite different from that of her fiery male counterpart. In other words, you could go outside with a, a whiteboard and reflect sunlight. And the reflected sunlight is going to have the same properties as the sun that's coming down to hit the reflector. Uh, yet, if you analyze the light coming from the sun and analyze the light coming from the moon, you got totally different light there. So it doesn't really appear to be a reflector. Um, Isaiah also confirms this idea by stating that the moon shall not cause her light to shine. Later in the text, Isaiah then goes on to describe, to describe the heavens rolling up like a scroll, Isaiah 34, 4. And all the host of heaven, i.e. the stars, shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll, and all their hosts shall fall down as the leaf falleth off from the vine, and as a falling fig from the fig tree. Wait, wait. what? The universe is going to roll up like a scroll, and its hosts... The stars are going to fall down, presumably on us. How are we to imagine the cosmos that Carl Sagan and Stephen Hawking wants us to believe in doing this? And I got a picture there of uh, an alleged photograph from the, supposedly from the uh, Hubble Space Telescope looking into an area of, of uh, what they thought was a void in space. And when they put it on the deep field or whatever, uh, magnification or whatever they do, uh, it showed, uh, you know, 
thousands of other galaxies out there, thousands and thousands. So, of course, if there's that much in that tiny little space that Hubble was able to capture, the the, the uh, implication is that there are trillions and trillions of these in every little space that we could look in. As far as we can see in every hole in space where we see a blackness between stars, there's probably trillions of galaxies out there. And all these galaxies have stars in them, and all the stars have planets around them. And yet Isaiah is telling us that it's all going to roll up and it's all going to fall to the Earth. So are we to accept the notion that the literal fate of the allegedly ever-expanding universe as taught to us in school literally hinges on the sin and subsequent judgment of humans on Earth? I mean, we're getting a new heavens and a new Earth. It's it's okay for us to figure out, well, we screwed up, so the earth, God's going to burn a place up and start over here on Earth. We can get a new Earth. But he says a new heavens, too, which means everything's going to get burnt up. So... Uh, I mean, either we got to throw the Bible out. I mean, just throw it out, and that's what the secularist wants you to do. Or we've got some serious problems here uh, headed our way. <laughs> um, you know, if Andromeda is heading our way and all these other trillions of galaxies with, you know, solar systems uh, in them are all going to roll up and fall like figs to the earth, man, we're screwed. That's a seriously bad day. I mean, all – I continue here um, – are all the world's allegedly orbiting countless suns and billions of galaxies all going to be judged and burned up because of us? Is that really fair? Yet this is exactly what we are literally forced to accept if we are to believe the Holy Spirit inspired words of prophets like Isaiah or apostles like Peter and John, where Second Peter 3.10 says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, and the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat and the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up revelation 6:14 and the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together and every mountain and island moved out of their places by the way we must also note that isaiah's prophecy concerning the stars falling finds a second witness in the words of yeshua jesus christ himself we see in matthew 24 Verses uh, 24 through 31. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall shew great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For... Wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and not does it say reflect her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the son of man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other this is an extraordinary passage of scripture First, we are told that we will essentially be bedazzled by signs and wonders, such that even the very elect could be deceived by them. Then we are told what not to look for and what we should look for in the coming return of our Savior. And immediately after the tribulation, we discover that the sun is going to be darkened and the moon will not, will no longer give, not reflect, her light. And the stars will literally fall from heaven. Again, we find another witness concerning the stars falling by our Savior in the revelation of Jesus Christ as given to the Apostle John at Revelation 6.13. And the stars of heaven fell onto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. That's what was re revealed to us by God from two different witnesses, one of them being the Creator himself over hundreds of years. So if we say we take the Bible literally... We'll have a big problem with these scriptures. Then again, what right do we have to not take them literally? In other words, it is only our preconceived notions of stars such as Arcturus, Vega, Pollux, Aldebaran, Betelgeuse, and Sirius as essentially being distant suns with planets going around them that prevent us from taking these scriptures literally. I mean, it would be a very bad day if stars are what Carl Sagan and other monkey man scientists would have us to believe they are come falling down to earth like figs. But what if the stars really are intelligent beings 
we see a number of references to the stars as angels. Take these, for instance, Job 28, 4 uh, through 7. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Singing stars during the creation account? Note also that Job 38.7 quite literally obliterates, I mean, it just obliterates the bogus Sethite theory concerning Genesis 6.4. The sons of Seth were not there at the start of creation. Sorry. Neither does the text of Genesis 6 make any mention whatsoever of the sons of Seth and the daughters of Cain. That's bogus eisegetical theology at its best. No, the sons of God of Job 38.7 are the same as the sons of God of Genesis 6.4. They are angels. The Apostle John makes note of an angel as a star also in Revelation 9, 1. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven onto the earth, and to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. Um, th this is, incidentally, as a sidebar here, this is one of the reasons why Doug Hamp and I haven't done any more uh, Quest for Truth shows, because we finished off in Revelation chapter 8, and we're about to go into Revelation 9, and that's Revelation 9, 1. And I'm like, dude, I, I've got to, I got to finish hopping down this bunny trail. He's like, well, you're on your own on that. I mean, he wasn't, he wasn't going to join me on this flat earth quest. Um, because whatever conclusion I finally do come to in all of this, it's going to affect the way, um, at least the way I'm going to view the book of Revelation anyway. And so as I continue to plow through this, um, I'm really seeing some good evidence. This is more than suggesting that the stars are not what we are told by monkey man science, but that they are rather to be understood as intelligent beings. We see that people even began to worship the stars as godlike sentient beings in uh, 2 Kings 21.5. And he built altars for all the hosts of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. 2 Kings 23, beginning in verse 5, or actually it is verse 5, in the International Standard Version, the king unseated the idolatrous priests whom the kings of Judah had appointed to burn incense in the high places throughout the cities of Judah and in the environs surrounding Jerusalem, including those who had been burning incense to Baal, to the sun, to the moon, to the constellations, and to every star in the heavens. Okay, they're worshiping these things. Now, note, I chose the ISV for 2 Kings 23.5 because I believe the King James Version is an error. Yes, it is an error in its use of the word planets for Mazaloth which is the Hebrew version of what we call the Zodiac, or as the International Standard Version and most other English translations uh, render it, the constellations. Uh, it's not talking about planets there. Maseroth or Mazaloth is not the planets. It's constellations. Uh, Acts 7.43 says, Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Moloch, the star of your god Remphan, figures which ye made to worship them, and I carry you away beyond Babylon. Okay, so they're worshiping a god that has represented by a star here. And incidentally, it, it's my opinion that the so-called Star of David traces right back to this pagan uh, symbol right here. But again, that's another show also. Biblically speaking, the hosts of heaven are usually associated with the armies of heaven, or in other words, the angels. But the hosts of heaven is also frequently used as a reference to the stars. Could there be a reason for this? I think so. Note also, if this proves to be true, then we must reevaluate our thinking concerning this scripture too. Revelation 19, verses 11 through 14. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Again, all through the scriptures, we see references to the armies of heaven as the hosts of heaven and as Yahuwah being the Lord of hosts and such. Nowhere do we ever see a bride depicted as a soldier. Newly wedded women, especially, do not go to war. 
So it cannot be Christians, i.e. the bride of Christ, who are supposedly raptured out earlier that are coming back with him on these horses, right? Could it literally be the hosts of heaven, as in the billions of stars we see up there in the dome, that are coming back with him? I mean, one-third gets scooped down with, in Revelation 12. The dragon scoops down one-third for himself. And, you know, one-third comes to earth. So could it be that the remaining two-thirds, as soon as heaven starts to open up like a scroll, if the dome opens up like a football stadium, and uh, Yeshua starts coming through on his horse, that all the remaining two-thirds fall into formation behind him? I mean, that's really kind of what we get when we read this. You know, could it be? They're the ones that are coming back with them. I don't know, but I'll cover this more in depth uh, when I finally finish the Angels as Stars blog. 